Well, that was disheartening. Not in the sense that the episode wasn't good. It was just disheartening in that it stuck a little closer to actual history than than what my soul wanted it to do. And that sounds overly dramatic, but in a minute I will explain where I'm coming from on that. So this episode of Vikings basically detailed detailed the uh, the attack by Ragnar, King Horik, and Lagatha on the on the English forces. They've they've landed in in Wessex and they are marching on the on the British forces. However, King Egbert again has been assembling allies. He's been assembling armies of his own, and he is he has been steadily learning or. He intends to implement a strategy that Athelstan taught to him upon reading, I believe it was Caesar, the exploits of Caesar, and and he seeks to employ he seeks to implement a strategy first uh, first tried out by the Romans. So, needless to say, the raid doesn't go so well for Ragnar. It's uh. And that actually brings me to my first point of praise for this episode, is that for the first time in this series, at least so far, we have seen Ragnar get defeated in battle. Not not like man to man, he doesn't really get bested by by any individual by any individual warrior. But his forces are routed and and basically run off of the battlefield. Now, granted, this isn't necessarily his fault, or at least not completely. Actually, no, it's not his fault. Because um, King Horik, like we saw in, la in last week's episode, deliberately sabotaged the negotiations by slaughtering King Eckbert's forces in retaliation for Eckbert forcing him out of Wessex in the first raid. So, so Horik, he is blinded by... By, by his pride and his need for revenge. So he charges, he, he leads the, the warriors against Ragnar's wishes into the open battlefield because, he, because they're at the top of this hill and he sees, he sees a large English force at the bottom of the hill and he's like, let's go kill these guys. Um, and Ragnar's like, like sh shouldn't, shouldn't we wait? Um, this, this doesn't really feel right. And King Horik basically says, yeah, "What are you talking about? We we have the advantage of the hill. Look at them! They're look at them! They're just a bunch of British wusses." So they march down, and surprise, surprise, they are they are ambushed by by the forces of Northumbria, one of the allies that King Eckbert sought to to rally to his cause. So, so Ragnar's forces are completely outnumbered, they are outflanked, and they are forced to retreat. I mean, they implement sh the shield wall, but the shield wall proves relatively ineffective against the English cavalry. And also they are overwhelmed by sheer numbers. So, seeing, seeing that play out, seeing Ragnar deter- seeing Ragnar finally come to the conclusion that in the midst of battle he will he is in a losing scenario and seeing him ultimately make the very difficult decision to retreat was well handled I mean I like the use of slow motion I like the music that they implemented here I really like Travis Fimmel's performance um, so yeah that was that was a pretty big that was a pretty big step for Ragnar's character he's essentially been humbled as it were now, much less interesting, or at least in my opinion, was the the continuing spite between between Loki and or between Floki and Ragnar, because Floki is continuing to be won over by King Horik. Now, to this episode's credit, they do they do offer some semblance of justification, however comparatively weak it is, in that Floki and King Horik 
they they share the same beliefs. They share they share the same opinions of the gods. King Horik is, or at least he appears to respect Floki more, whereas Ragnar he has basically been kind of he's treating he's treating Bjorn with with more favor than than anyone else. Also, also he believes that Ragnar is kind of blinded by his love for his family instead of instead of really focusing on his duties as a leader. So, so that's that's what Floki gets because not only is he is he giving a lot of attention to his son who is who is very who is notably dubbed uh, Bjorn Ironside in this episode. Finally, he gets the, the surname Ironside. But but also, Ragnar let Flo let Rolo back into his ranks, even after Rolo betrayed them by siding with Jarl Borg at the beginning of the season. Floki does not believe that Rolo deserved that second chance. So, so in with all that being said, there is there is some there is some reasoning behind Floki's spike towards Ragnar, but I still don't really think it's strong enough. At least not for a character as as eccentric as Floki, because I don't really think we got enough, or at least I don't really think his dissatisfaction with Ragnar was as much at the forefront as it should have been earlier in the season. I mean, if it, I mean, if they focus more on Floki and his and his loss of faith in Ragnar as a leader, then this change wouldn't have been so jarring and and seemingly out of nowhere. But like I said, they do try to remedy they do try to remedy that by giving him by reminding us of why he did the things he did or why he is currently losing losing loyalty to Ragnar. But with that said, King Horik is still an idiot. King Horik still needs to die. <laughs> um I can't really blame Donald Lowe because he he plays the part well. There's there's not really a bad performance in this episode. Um, or in this show, or at least not thus far. I mean, probably the worst performance either comes from from Alyssa Sutherland or or the or Bjorn's girlfriend, the servant girl, who is released from her servitude this episode, so she can be with Bjorn with seemingly without any restrictions now. Did I really care? Not really. I mean, I like Bjorn, but I don't know anything about this chick aside from the fact that she has little to no self-confidence um i can't remember the name of the actress uh it's gaia something or gaia something she was in the legend of hercules but but yeah Ra ragnar's ragnar's humbling was handled very well um and i it actually had me on the edge of my seat when rolo got captured because I'm really going to like Rolo. I mean, he's one of the most interesting characters on the show, and seeing him and seeing him uh, in such a vulnerable position or a comparatively vulnerable position, especially after he has essentially redeemed himself in the eyes of his brother, was was very suspenseful. At first, I thought he was dead. Um, I was relieved when he was alive. Um, but then I thought to myself, you know, how much better is it to be an a, an English prisoner in this time period, a, a pagan prisoner of the English, than, than it is to be dead. But thankfully, thankfully they returned him to the Vikings promptly. I mean, I don't really know how, I don't really know how much that adds to the situation dramatically, but that actually leads me to, to the next point I wanted to make, or the next positive I wanted to make. I'm going to move these headphones. Um, which is, the ultimate turnout of this scenario, or at least the, or at least the position or the verdict that they reach for the time being, is decidedly uncinematic. In the war between the Vikings and the English, this episode ends with there really being no clear victor. This episode ends with them proposing a truce, with King Eckbert extending a truce and asking the Vikings to agree to a treaty and that they can have a bunch of land to farm they can they they're offered positions as mercenaries in the slutty princess's kingdom because she 
she wants mercenaries to help uh, to help take over her own kingdom. And and in addition, if upon acceptance of this deal, they get Rolo back. So not a bad deal, considering considering the English had a hostage, um, a very important hostage, or at least important as he was to Ragnar. So yeah, it it basically exemplifies that in real life a lot of these combat scenarios don't really end with a definitive victory over the other. I mean, they don't end with the good guys completely wiping out the bad guys, especially especially not when the line between good guy and bad guy is so blurred in a show like this. Because King Eckbert is not really an evil guy. I mean, yeah, he he wants to profit from his land. He wants to to make to make a profit. He wants to he a lot of what he does is for his own ends, but he he by no means has any sort of bloodlust, or at least not that we've seen so far. And that's that's one thing I actually have to give this show. It's kind of a weird compliment here, but when Athelstan the priest went back to Ragnar, um, and went back to uh, to to the Viking village to kind of in essence abandoning Christianity altogether. I was a little sad. I was a little sad when when King Eckbert was walking around the little Caesar the the little Roman shrine that he had. Um and he was just thinking to himself, I've I've lost what who could have potentially I've lost a kindred spirit. I've I've lost someone who appreciates these things just as much as I do. I've I've lost a potential friend. Um, so I was a little sad, and Linus Roche really carries that scene very well with no dialogue. But with that said, it felt appropriate for Athelstan to to go back to the ways of the Vikings, especially given how conflicted he's been during his time with the English. And I think it was a necessary step for him because because after spending four years among the Vikings and being given the chance, because Ragnar gives him a choice, being given the chance to return to Christianity, something that he once held very dear, um, I think it's I think it's a, a pretty significant step for his character in turning his back on on what he had previously known and embracing what embracing what he now considers to be far more natural in terms of lifestyle and in terms of and in terms of uh, worship because he says something along the lines of when it's raining when it's raining i i picture i picture my own god but when when there is thunder i think of thor or i think of odin um so that was a pretty good that was a pretty good visual and a pretty good comparison and would would it have been more satisfying to some people if there had been a little bit more conflict, or, or if he had stayed with, with, uh, with the English, probably. But personally, I felt it was the appropriate move, given, given how, how conflicted he's been. Again, how conflicted he's been all season, and, and really lending a sense of closure to, to this whole, to his, to his old life. This really re represents a step of a step in the right direction, a step in the sense that he can finally move on. So I liked I liked that part. The battle scene was fantastic. Like I said, you really get the sense that this is this is a very desperate situation for the Vikings. Um, but it's no less brutal. It's no less well shot. Um, the cam the camera focuses focuses in the camera zooms in just enough to put you in the heat of the action but not so much that you can't tell what's going on if I was editing it I probably would have pulled back um, one or two times to really get a get a sense of the entire battlefield um, to see the Vikings getting flanked it's kind of like it's kind of like what you would see in an RTS game or or a Peter Jackson movie where the camera just kind of pans around the whole battlefield and lets you see the armies duke it out from afar to really give you a sense of the battle's scope. But 
but as as it was, the fight was pretty good, and the aftermath of the fight felt appropriate. And again, it's not cinematic, or or at least not or at least not in a way that feels cliche. The good guys do not do not. Uh, or let me put it this way, the protagonists of the show, the Vikings, do not completely eradicate the English. They make a deal with them, as as a lot of wars end up resulting in. I mean, I I heard this one saying once that wars are not really won. They are they are just eventually both sides just reach an agreement. So I thought so I thought that was something again, like the like Athelstan's choice, I thought was really appropriate, especially it being based on on true Viking uh, Viking history and legend. So yeah, I really like this episode. Again, some of the stuff between Floki and King Horik, while improved, did still feel a little forced. But again, it's it's it took it once again shows the risks that this show is willing to go to in terms of. In terms of not de in terms of not deviating from these from actual history too much and providing us with a it's embellished to a it's embellished to a certain extent in that they are making it cinematic for the in this in their in that they are making it cinematic enough to be a TV show and not a documentary they are creating these characters and they are creating this world they are they're writing this dialogue to to be cinematic enough for a TV show, but they don't deviate from actual history and try and make it more more fairy tale like or more storybook like. Um, because life can be interesting and true history can be interesting, and this show seems to find the right balance between between dramatic taking dramatic liberties with the story and sticking close to actual history. So. Yeah, again, I really like this episode, and it has me really looking forward to to the season finale. I'm wondering what they're going to do. So, until then, I I am going to turn the camera off now. <laughs>